Thank you for coming. My name is uh, Natalie Mara. I'm the executive director of the Ontario Health Coalition. Uh, we appreciate you being here. All of our, we, we represent um, more than 400 member organizations, including the patient advocacy groups in Ontario, all of the major seniors organizations, um, unions, health professionals, doctors uh, that support public Medicare, the nursing organizations, nonprofits, ethnocultural groups, and so on. Um, and all of our member organizations, and we represent, sorry, um, more than half a million Ontarians and 50 local chapters across the province. All of our member organizations and affiliates are at the highest levels of concern about the leaked legislation. It's a leaked omnibus health care bill. Um, and we, we uh, have held two emergency meetings uh, to discuss it. And uh, we wanted to you know, bring a warning that we don't think really has been talked about yet in the analysis of this legislation and its consequences. Uh, and in this, I can say with certainty that all of our member organizations that span the spectrum that we represent um, are speaking with one voice on this. Um, one of the things that the new legislation, I think that there are some misnomers. While the health minister uh, spoke uh, at her press conference last week, she said, we don't intend, you'll still be able to use your OHIP card. We're not going to change the OHIP system fundamentally. That really does downplay the impacts of the bill and the extent to which the bill privatizes or gives new powers to order the privatization of um, significant swaths of Ontario's public health care system. And so very quickly, this is how we see the legislation. The legislation takes the, Lynn, the existing Lynn legislation and it bundles all the Lynns into one. So yes, it creates a super agency, which will be a super bureaucracy, including Cancer Care Ontario, the organ donation system, um, uh, Health Quality Ontario, and all of the functions of the Lynns, covering virtually you know, most of the service providers, hospitals, long-term care, home care, et cetera, in the province. To put this in context, this new super bureaucracy will cover uh, 141 public hospitals, you know, um, uh, two or sorry, 262 actual local public hospitals, 141 hospital corporations, 629 long-term care homes, all of home care, more than a thousand clinics, doctors' offices, and so on and so forth. It's a gargantuan piece of legislation with very far-reaching implications. It requires that the new super agency find mega mergers. These are not just your regular merger. In every merger, more than two services has to be merged. So these are mega mergers. It gives new powers that had not existed before for the super agency and the ministry to order the privatization of any part of the supply chain and of procurement, undefined and therefore unlimited. Um, and also unprecedented in Canada, I think, uh, to which company those services would be privatized. Um, they also have new powers to uh, facilitate the privatization of uh, a whole range of clinical and non-clinical uh, healthcare services. So in layperson's terms, this is an omnibus bill. It will require the repeal and amendment of dozens of major pieces of healthcare legislation. It will result in chaos in the healthcare system, likely for years, more than a decade. The last round of restructuring uh, under the Mike Harris government was much smaller than this, but similar direction. Uh, and it led to 10 years, more than 10 years, of mass instability across the hospital sector. This includes more sectors, mega-level mergers, uh, and more powers to order privatization than we have ever seen before in any legislation uh, in Ontario. Um, so we are extremely concerned that it will be extremely destabilizing to the healthcare system. When when this government was elected in the campaign, we uh, had local health coalitions ask Doug Ford in different towns, will he promise not to privatize health care? He promised outright in the election campaign not to privatize health care. And we believe that to the people of Ontario, the understanding was that he would fundamentally break 
with the direction of the wind government that had put their local hospitals in jeopardy, that had put local services, local emergency departments in jeopardy, that had created uh, a crisis of hallway medicine in which we have too few hospital beds and people lining uh, hospital hallways. Since the, the beginning of January, the government announcements and now this leaked legislation show that not only are they continuing the same direction of austerity and restructuring and uh, centralization of services, um, but actually that it's, you know, the same program, only much, much worse uh, than we have uh, ever seen. We also have serious issues, uh, and I, we should say that this is not a piece of legislation that is going to create seamless integration. This is a piece of legislation in which um, in Ottawa, it may be that a for-profit long-term care home wants to take over um, the chronic care hospital beds or convalescent care, and so they make a bid to do that. And in Chatham, uh, a hospital wants to take over, or an amalgamated hospital corporation wants to take over home care, uh, so they make a bid to do that. Or private clinics want to take on, a, um, you know, the surgeries and diagnostics and so on in a range of hospitals across southeastern Ontario. It will be ad hoc and patchwork across the province depending on bids because they've chosen a market system of bidding like competitive bidding was in home care to bring this in. So across the province, it'll be different services merged and amalgamated in these mega mergers. I don't know how one could ever stitch together an actual health system out of um, what will come from this kind of bidding process. Who will be favored? Well, in any bidding process, the chain companies that can hire in consultants that make multiple bids, they get to practice multiple times uh, across the province, uh, and also are experts in writing bids, have a much higher degree of winning contracts in this type of bidding process than small not-for-profits and community-based local services. Nobody in Ontario voted for this. We have a se se serious issue about the process um, that was taken and the health minister's statements last week. So I'll just end with the process issues. So um, the, the legislation has clearly been in the works for months, according to the leaked documents. Um, in addition, uh, decisions have gone to cabinet and been approved by cabinet. Normally, if a government was going to undertake a major, major policy change of this sort, and I can't think of any larger policy change than this kind of omnibus bill, um, they would issue a white paper or discussion paper. That would be subject to broad public consultation. Then and only then they would draft legislation. That legislation would go uh, through first and second reading. Then it would go to public hearings across the province. Those would be meaningful. The public would have an opportunity to have their say. The legislation would be amended with public input. None of that uh, has happened here so far. And the documents show that the plan of the government was to introduce this bill in February. So we know they're only going to start sitting in, that would be the end of February, uh, to actually put out the tenders in March. And the bill wouldn't even be proclaimed till July. The tenders would go out before the bill was even proclaimed. Um, this is clearly an intent to push this thing through as fast as possible before the public ever catches up with what the real agenda is here with the government and before anyone can mount any kind of significant opposition. So thanks for listening. I'm going to pass it over. Um, this is Michael Hurley. He's the president of the Ontario Council of Hospital Unions. Michael. Okay, thank you very much, Natalie. <clears throat> Why would you create a parallel Ministry of Health? We already have an organization that's um, responsible for all of these healthcare entities. Why would we create a duplicate bureaucracy? And um, we're afraid that the reason is because uh, uh, the consolidation of all the funding streams allows the privatization, which is explicit in the bill, to unfold. And uh, that'll unfold for, uh, it's pretty clear, laboratories, orange, um, the, the supply chain and procurement, which could be anything, including diagnostics. Um, but ultimately, we're talking about clinical services as well. There's no need to create a parallel bureaucracy unless um, the goal is to marketize the services and to, uh, and to sell them. And I put it to you that Ontario's problem 
with respect to health care delivery. I mean, uh, voices from as far away as British Columbia and Nova Scotia are telling us, and, and internationally, that our cancer care operation here uh, is, uh, is an example uh, to the rest of the world. Our organ transplant programs are exemplary also. Our hospitals are operating um, in terms of length of stay, in terms of patient outcomes, in terms of um, what they do with money, the, one of the most efficient in the world. Uh, so why do they need uh, this extra level of bureaucracy? Uh, and the reason, unfortunately, is because uh, explicit in the legislation is the tendering of services. So. Those of us who work in the healthcare system, those of us who work in the hospital system, in cancer care, um, are uh, distressed that there has been no consultation with any of the workforce, but more importantly, any members of the public about this enormous system transformation. And most importantly, the transformation of a system based on not-for-profit delivery in most of its aspects to one which can be sold. Um, and that's very disturbing. And we're, we're, um, we're here today to say that uh, we won't simply stand by and allow services like the air ambulance service or laboratories and diagnostics or, or procurement or clinical services to be marketed. We won't. The public won't support it. We won't support it. And we will fight it every inch of the way. So people should gird themselves for a long and protracted battle to defend Ontario's health care system from this secretive transformation. And this is Dr. Ritika Goel, and she is here from Canadian Doctors for Medicare. Hi, my name is Ritika Goel. I'm a family physician working in Toronto at a community-based clinic and in the shelter system and a board member with Canadian Doctors for Medicare. As a physician working in Ontario, I have grave concerns with the information we are hearing about proposed changes to our healthcare system from this government. It's unclear to healthcare providers in Ontario how the creation of a super agency, which would eliminate various existing agencies doing important work like Cancer Care Ontario and Health Quality Ontario, would help us improve care. It's unclear how reorganizing the healthcare system with new powers to contract out services for for profit facilities with no consultation with frontline providers or patients would improve care. The real question we're left asking is what problem the government is trying to solve and how their proposed plans would do so. We also wonder why these large changes are being finalized without any discussion with the public, patients, healthcare providers and policy experts who know the solutions best. We do need to address the waits in our emergency rooms and the lack of long-term care beds, mental health care services, and we need to discuss electronic health records that are connected on a common platform and to determine if we focus too much on in-hospital care. But if these are the issues the Ford government is looking to fix, the public needs a step-by-step, dollar-by-dollar explanation of how a super agency will fix that. Without careful planning and consideration, hasty reorganizations can jeopardize the important frontline care being provided, and we can't play with people's lives. The secrecy and lack of process and consultation surrounding this draft legislation leaves us unable to determine the intentions and goals behind this bill. We're concerned about the potential for allowing private payment for services, which is not only a blatant violation of the Canada Health Act, but would also threaten fair and equitable access if those with money can just jump the queue. We have concerns the government may be looking to farm out publicly funded services to for-profit facilities. Who would be regulating this outsourcing and subsequently the services provided? Who is keeping patients and care providers safe in those facilities? We know that for-profit facilities are more likely to try to charge patients privately and cut corners when their bottom line is not health but profit. There's no doubt that we need to be constantly evaluating what works and what could be improved in our public health care system, but this should be a dynamic process that always respects the principles of the Canada Health Act so that care is equitable, publicly administered, comprehensive, portable, and accessible. It is essential that each of these agencies that are now under the microscope, um, that we're able to maintain what they do to improve population health, access, quality, patient experience, and health provider well-being. We need to know if care being provided under any different system would be safe and effective, patient-centered, timely, 
equitable, and would it contribute to the stewardship of the healthcare system? Until we have the answers to these questions, we cannot allow this government to run roughshod over patients in this province. Thank you. Any questions? Um, we've had a little trouble getting any information. <laughs> so sorry. It's okay. I have. I don't know how to turn it off. That's okay. Um, so, sorry. I actually really. It's a brand new phone. <laughs> I thought I turned off the notification. I can't find the notification. It's my code on it. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Edgar, can you take it out of here? I'm so sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, so we've had some trouble getting answers from the government about what is that is happening because they're not ready to announce it yet. So they haven't been clear on specifics. One of the few things that they have denied to me is that there will be a bidding process, um, which you have spoken about at length this morning. So can you lay out why you see there being a, a bidding process for how offering health services? Yeah. So in on page, this is the um, the the briefing, the internal briefing document that was leaked on um, Tuesday. Yeah. So in it, um, it says they are going to launch the expression of interest as the tenders for the my care groups on in March. They say that's more like requesting information and actually soliciting bids. If that is the case, does that change how you conceive of what they're doing here? The tendering process in Ontario is expressions of interest, then um, RFPs, requests for proposals, then bids are evaluated, shortlist, then bids are are. It's the first stage of it, the tendering process. There's no. There is no question about that. Yeah. Do you, uh, Christine Elliott has also said that everyone, you know, we've asked her about that, what Jessica just asked, and about Canada Health Act stuff. Um, will you still be able to pay with your OHIP card? And she says, yes, she'll still be able to pay for everything with your OHIP card, but you don't believe that either. And I just wondered if there's anything in that, all those leaked documents that, t that tells you that or if it's just that you don't believe them? Well, we've, we've called all of, so in the leaked documents, there is the exp express language that they will um, allow um, uh, public nonprofit and for-profit um, corporations to bid for the services. Um, and that's expressly in one of these, um, one of these documents that was leaked on Tuesday. In, we have called all of the private clinics in the country. We've done that twice in 2008, 2018. The Globe and Mail also in tandem with us did an investigative report um, contacting all the private clinics in the country. We also phoned uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2016, all the private clinics in Ontario. And we caught them red handed, the vast majority of them extra bill patients. There is no question that when you turn over the ownership of healthcare services from public and nonprofit to private and for profit, that they uh, bring in extra billing and two tier healthcare. Um, they bring in extra user fees for patients. That's how they maximize their profits. Um, and so the evidence has been very clear for more than a decade in the country um, that the that the transfer of public and nonprofit health care services to private and for profit results in two tier uh, Medicare uh, and that no government has actually managed to control them. Can, I, can I just uh, can, can I, I just, just for what, what are they charging extra for? Are they charging extra for medically necessary services? Yeah. So in in Ontario, for example, the cataract surgery clinics, um, they charge uh, so under OHIP um, the, the ophthalmologists are, are uh, paid 557 I think it is, dollars per cataract surgery. They bill OHIP for that. And in, then in a number of clinics, as well as billing OHIP, they charge a patient usually about $2,000 per eye for cataract surgery in clear violation of the Canada Health Act. A number of them also commingle services. They add in extra lenses. They charge people for extra eye measurements. They manipulate patients into paying for medically unnecessary eye measurement tests for a couple of hundred dollars an eye and so on. These are seniors, by the way, living on fixed incomes that are being charged for uh, health care services that they have already paid for in their taxes and ought never to be charged for. That's what Medicare is. Uh, and so that's in Ontario. But across the country, in B.C., the private clinics are charging $32,000 for a hip replacement surgery. I mean, they're charging regularly $1,000 for a basic MRI. An average MRI in Ontario is funded under OHIP at between $280 and $350. Like, this, this, this is 
the destruction of public Medicare. If they turn over the clinical services to the for-profit uh, clinics, it will destroy, it will dismantle public Medicare, and it will lead to user pay health care like the American health system. And it will usher in those chain companies, those chain hospital companies and so on. In fact, they're very likely to be the most successful in this type of bidding process. And Sorry, worse, Michael. worse than the charging, the Canadian Medical Association Journal published a study that compared death rates in private and uh, uh, not-for-profit dialysis clinics and found higher death rates at the private clinics. And the reason was because, among other things, the owners were watering down the blood cleaning products to increase their profitability. So, like, you know, we put it to you that, you know, there's the problem of the charging and there's also the problem of the higher morbidity, private hospitals uh, and many other services. There's lots of lots of uh, existing uh, data that shows higher rates of, uh, among other things, death. So, like, this isn't something we welcome and embrace as uh, as providers of health care. Not at all. Yeah, so I think, I think the issue is that uh, even if you can access certain services by paying through OHIP, which is what Christine Elliott is saying, the concern is if those services are delivered at a for-profit facility rather than a not-for-profit facility. And so that's sort of uh, the piece that's being left out in the discussion. So a for-profit facility, by definition, in terms of what the research has shown and what the experience has shown, they tend to charge patients privately. They tend to find ways to maximize their bottom line, which is profit, uh, and that's a concern for patient safety. Um, it's a concern for health outcomes. There, there is research showing that for-profit versus not-for-profit uh, have worse outcomes, poorer health outcomes, as well as charging people privately. So that's a great concern. Just to go back to the, when you see the bidding process, when you look at those <coughs> terms and describe it, how, did you, how do you get from what you've read there to the idea that they could be bidding on specific surgical services and stuff like that? How do you, can you tell that up for us? So in the legislation, so when you look at the legislation, they took the Lynn's legislation and they incorporated all of it. And then they added some things on and they took some things away. So they stripped out of the Lynn's legislation all the public interest provisions virtually that we had won over the years in, in amendments and so on and when, when the legislation was brought in. So no open board meetings, no right to appeal. Um, the equity language, the principles of the Canada Health, all that stuff is gone, right? F so someone deliberately chose to strip the bill of those things, the, the robust public consultation process that had been won over years of complaints and so on. Uh, and then they added in additional powers. So one of the extraordinary powers is the power of the super agency to order the contracting of any of the supply chain or procurement and to which company the uh, health service provider, so that includes all the health services providers covered in here, um, uh, to which company they have to give that. Explicitly in, in the document are powers, enhanced powers for the minister and the super uh, agency to order the transfers of services and so on. In the leaked documents that give the briefings, not only do they have the timelines, including when the tenders are going to be issued according to their plans, but also they, they list who would be able to be involved in this process, and they list pu public not-for-profit and for-profit entities. So I don't think, like, it's pretty explicit. I'm sort of, I'm actually shocked that the minister continues to try and deny the plans. Uh, one of the issues that we had was last week she stood in a press conference and said specifically, um, you know, I have not seen this document that the NDP leaked today. But, and, you know, talked about how the bill was written by um, the nonpartisan civil service and so on and so forth, as if the government had not directed the legislation, as if cabinet had not already made a decision to approve the direction explicitly, as if she hadn't signed the orders in council herself to move down this road and to create the holding company for the super agency. I mean, those denials are absolutely clearly very misleading to the public. So the minister is choosing her specific words extremely carefully, but sidestepping the big picture, which is absolutely her government has been involved for months now in the creation of an omnibus health care bill that would restructure the entire health care system and turn over 
swaths of it to for-profit companies potentially. There's, you know, I don't think she may be just mincing words to try and sidestep it, but that is what's happening. The minister says that she has spoken extensively with doctors, nurses, front uh, frontline healthcare workers about the healthcare system in general. Have you seen, or what type of evidence have you seen that they've actually consulted on this specific um, measure? So um, speaking as a healthcare provider, uh, we are not aware of any consultations that have been done. Certainly people that are experts in this field have uh, the ideas of what innovations we need, what solutions we need, have seen no consultation. What we have seen is what the public and the media are seeing, which is leaked uh, you know, draft legislation and then the legislation that has come out with no explanation of how they have reached the conclusions that are in those. So before you saw the draft legislation, was there any whisper of this happening? Did anyone have any inclination? Was there any conversation with any healthcare partner or provider? No, oh, and we've been trying to meet with the health minister for months. We have not been able to get a meeting. No. And when you say you're prepared to fight for this, what exactly do you have in mind? Well, that's uh, that. You know, that that's a collective uh, thing, really. I mean, we're. We're gonna we're gonna see what everyone would be prepared to do to defend the healthcare system. So, I mean, uh, yeah, please. Our initial plan is um, we're holding a mass rally at the Ontario Legislature uh, at, in late April. Um, we will do a cross-province tour of town hall meetings. We'll um, consult with the public on that. We'll engage. We'll create a, a local campaign. Go door to door. Um, to in as many towns as we can, talking to people about the threat of for-profit privatization of our public health care and the mega mergers. We have fought for now 15 years to save small and rural hospitals and emergency departments under the mergers that already exist. It's been devastating to those communities. They are not going to want another set of mass mergers in this province. Uh, and, uh, and we will uh, do that uh, uh, leading into the April rally. If the government moves forward with this legislation, we'll call a referendum, a voluntary referendum in Ontario, and we'll aim to get a million people or more to vote against uh, the for-profit privatization and the mega-mergers of Ontario's healthcare system. And how then we'll go from there. How do you enforce the call for a referendum? Well, we've done it before. You know, in uh, when the government, when the Liberals uh, brought in the P3 privatization of the hospitals, uh, in eight towns, we held uh, voluntary referendums. In all of those communities, we had higher voter turnout than, you know, the municipal elections did. They were, you know, very significant. We held uh, volunteers host ballot boxes outside the Shoppers Drug Marts and the Tim Hortons and the corner stores and so on. We did three weeks of media leading in. We Everyone knew that we went door to door to every household. Uh, everyone knew that the referendum was coming. We gave people a choice. Do you want to see the P3 privatization of your hospital? Yes or no? Uh, and people voted en masse, you know, 98%, 99% opposing the P3 hospitals all across uh, those eight towns, I think we got 180,000 votes or something like that. We did it again when the Wynn government brought in a regulation to uh, contract the, sur the surgeries and um, diagnostics to private clinics. Uh, we did it in 10 towns and we got 150,000 votes. So we know how to do it and uh, we would, obviously this would be much bigger, it's a much m more significant threat. In every case where we've done it, the government has changed their policy direction fundamentally. Nobody wants to see that happening uh, across the province and I think that that will be uh, a very effective way to give Ontarians a real choice and to force some democracy where there has been none to date. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.